Thanks everyone for coming tonight. Uh, tonight we're here with Stefan Kinsella. We're going to talk about clarifying libertarian theory. You know, libertarian theory is something we all have our, our own opinions about. Uh, if you you know go into a room with a bunch of libertarians, you'll get more opinions than there are people. But you know, what is the correct libertarianism, and what are the limits of libertarianism? I, I think. Uh, Stefan Kinsella has some ideas on this, and he's going to share them with us. Uh, and if you don't know, somehow, uh, mm -hmm. Stefan Kinsella is a patent attorney, a libertarian legal theorist. He's the director of the Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. He's the founding and executive editor of Liberta Libertarian Papers. And, I mean, he last week he, uh, in my opinion, uh, won a debate here on Liberty Me uh, on IP versus Alex Baker, but uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Seth. Uh, Matt, um, I just sent you some links that um, I want to share with people here to look into this further and to find some slides. Um, people might know that I talk a lot about intellectual property. I'm sometimes asked to speak on other topics, which I enjoy because IP is not my only or main, main even main issue. Um, on this talk, uh, topic, I think I've spoken at least three times uh, on the Tom Woods show and in Turkey uh, at Hans Hoppe's uh, PFS and um, uh, one other time as well. So the links to those shows are in my podcast feed, and I can share them here or somewhere else. Uh, and they, they, two of those have links to PowerPoint slides with links to some of the topics we're going to talk about, and one of them goes into a lot of detail. Um, what I'd like to do is just kind of start from the beginning and uh, talk for a while, but I'd like to keep this interactive. So anyone, feel free to interrupt. If I don't see your questions in the sidebar, you can uh, interrupt me, or uh, Matt can interrupt me. Does everything sound okay, Matt? I see an er in the side. I want to make sure everything's fine. Can everyone hear me? Oh, I see he's posting my links. Okay. What I want to do is talk about some things I've noticed over the last 20, 25 years of discussing um, libertarian theory, libertarian applications with a lot of people. Um, and things I've learned about how you have to think yourself and how you have to approach other people that are either friendly discussants or newbies or hostile and dishonest. Um, so some of this is general and not really directly specific to libertarianism itself, but I've noticed that we are the subject of a lot of these fallacies and flaws and pitfalls ourselves. Okay, The first one is it's really important um, – um, as, as you get deeper into libertarian theory and discussions and arguments, and the more you tangle with opponents and with people on the outside, which is happening more and more because libertarianism – um, is becoming more and more prominent and well-known. Um, you have to be more and more careful with the terminology and the concepts that we use. Um, if nothing else, libertarianism and any body of thought to be correct needs to be consistent. So we have to strive for consistency, and that requires a certain consistency in language, uses, definitions. A lot of words have more than one meaning. Uh, so that's one thing we have to do, and I'm going to mention a few examples I've noticed over the years, um, things I've even had to change in my own usage to avoid perennial confusion or giving an opening to the opponent um, to sort of dishonestly um, um, use our own terminology against us. Um, and that that is the danger which I call equivocation. If you're familiar with equivocation, it's basically using a term – in two different ways, um, and there's a lot of instances of this that we libertarians face. Um, one would be something like, you know, um, well, if you're in favor of fairness or justice, how can you be in favor of letting a corporation fire someone for uh, having a disability or having the wrong race or whatever? So they try to sneak in these concepts like this. Uh, a more explicit example would be the example of government, and I'm going to use this to explain why I've tried to change my own terminology with the word government versus the word state. Okay, So 
we libertarians often use the word government as a synonym for state. So we, if you're an anarchist at least, you say you're against the government or you're against the state. And if you're a minarchist, you would say that you think we should have small government or a small state. So we use them basically as synonyms. This usage is not really exactly how it's used overseas in Europe. Uh, you'll notice the word they'll say uh, after a parliament is elected or whatever, they try to form a government. Um, they tend to use the word government more like we in the U.S. use the word administration. So we refer to the Obama administration as the current branch of appointed and or elected people in the current political cycle in the executive branch. But the apparatus of the state stays in place whether the current administration is the one in power or not. So when Obama leaves and then Hillary Clinton comes in or whoever the next one is, the government, as we Americans say it, stays in place. So we mean by government the state, and libertarians mean by state. Europeans by government usually mean the current administration. Um, the problem is you will get an opponent, and they will say something like um, – um, aren't you in favor of law and order? And we will say yes. Now, because we're libertarians, we believe there can be law and order, and there would be more law and order in a radically reduced state society or even in a stateless society. So we don't we don't equate the state with law and order. Okay, a lot of um, um, pro state advocates do. So in their minds. You can't have law and order without the state, and that's perfectly acceptable as an opinion to hold, but they pin it to the definition. So they try to get you to admit that you're in favor of government, and all you're admitting is that you believe in law and order. And then they say, aha, well, you can't oppose the state because then you're in favor of anarchy or chaos. So that's one example of equivocation. So that's one, exa that's one reason I myself have tried not to use the word government as much anymore. Um, I used to say I'm against – instead of saying I'm against public school, which is another example of a, of a, of a euphemism that masquerades as an argument, uh, it sort of hides the character of it. So some libertarians say it's a, it's a government school. Well, now I say it's a state school because government to me is a loaded term. It sometimes means law and order. It sometimes means the state, and you have to be careful because this, the statist will use that word against us uh, in both ways. Um, there's a lot of other examples of um, um, in, uncareful or imprecise use of terminology, uh, overuse of metaphors that can lead us astray. We, we really can't do without analogies and metaphors and flowery language, and that's fine, but we need to recognize when we're doing it. Okay. So for example, um, uh, in the intellectual property area um, or in property rights theory, um, we will hear – kind of a variant of a standard Lockean argument. That's the argument of John Locke, uh, which we modern libertarians adopt a variant of. John Locke argued that we have property rights because ultimately God gave us ownership of ourselves. So his argument is that God created the world. God gave man dominion over themselves and the world, animals and real estate and resources, and Therefore, every person owns themselves, which is a sort of imprecise term, which I'll get to in a second. And because you own yourself, because God gave it to you, he basically manumitted – he's basically our overlord or our slave owner in a sense, but he lets us be free. That's sort of the argument. It's not put, put that way usually, but that's the argument. If you own yourself, you own your labor. If you own your labor, you own things you mix it with. Uh, and if you own things you mix it with, then you own the first – you know, an unowned resource that you that you uh, homestead, you mix your labor with. That's the basic argument. I think the argument is confused and uh, imprecise and flawed. Uh, it's basically right in its conclusion, but it has unnecessary assumptions and steps to get there. And the problem is those unnecessary assumptions and steps are used by quasi-libertarians or non-libertarians to argue against the consistent libertarian position, especially – in the field of intellectual property. So the argument for intellectual property just says, well, you believe that you own yourself and you own your labor, and that's a thing of value. It's a thing of value because you can sell it, right? And um, uh, by the same token, you ideas or inventions or novels or patterns of information 
are created by a person's labor. They have value because you can sell them, and therefore, um, they're property too. Okay, so you see how this sloppy use of the Lockean argument and of terms like labor, self-ownership, even the word property, leads to a total confusion in the field of intellectual property. Basically, it leads to someone favoring intellectual property. Um, so let me explain what I think are the flaws here. Number one, the flaw in Locke's argument. Um, first of all, we don't own ourselves because the, the word self is a disputed term. It's not very precisely defined. Uh, what we mean is that you have a property right in your body. Your body is a coherent, scarce physical resource, which is possibly the subject of conflict and dispute. Some people want to control your body. Uh, if they want you to... Uh, 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 adopt your religion or submit to sex with you or to uh, fight in a war that they want you to fight in, they will threaten to invade the borders of your body with physical force like shooting it or hitting it or whatever um, if you don't obey their orders. That's what coercion is. Okay, So all these things are examples of the use of force against someone's body, which is the assertion of a property right over that person's body, which is basically a variant or a type of slavery. And libertarians, um, this shouldn't be news, are opposed to slavery because we believe in self-ownership, which means body ownership, which means each person is the owner of his own body, or at least the presumptive owner. Initially, you're presumed to be the owner of your body. You might lose that right if you perform some action like committing an act of murder or you're trying to attack someone. Uh, but the general presumption is everyone is the proper owner of their body. So we should talk about body ownership, not self-ownership. That will keep us from getting into these vague metaphors and talking about this kind of stuff. Now, labor is another term. Now, this word labor is basically a description of what people do when they act in the world, and they transform resources, they do things, they interfere with nature, you perform actions. That's called labor. Labor is just a type of action. It's a subset of action. Another type of action would be leisure. That's an action you engage in uh, for, for pure pleasure or for consumption, something you do for, as the, as the, as the, as the, for an end in itself. Um, if you watch a movie or you do something pleasurable, that's still an action, but it's not considered to be labor. Labor is a type of action, just the type of action you would otherwise not do if you didn't have to to change what's happening in the world. So labor is just a type of action. So when we say we own our labor, what you're really saying is you own actions. You might as well say you own your pleasure or you own your leisure or you own your actions, which are really nonsensical terms. The entire idea of ownership is basically the socially recognized legal right to control a given scarce resource, some resource that otherwise people could have conflict or clashing over. That's the entire purpose and nature of property rights. The only object of property rights can be a scarce resource, which gets to another confusion I've seen in libertarian thinking, this modern tendency to refer to the object of a property right as property. So if I own a baseball bat, or if I own a baseball, or an automobile, or a home, people will say, that baseball bat is your property. Okay, so they start using the word property to refer to the thing itself. Um, this is okay as far as it goes, but I found that that leads to confusion too because then people start asking the question like about intellectual property. They'll say, well, the way to settle the dispute about whether there ought to be property rights in ideas is we need to answer the question, is an idea property or is it not property? Now, this is not the way to answer this question. That's a way of… Uh, stating the result as a way to figure out what the result should be. Think about what property means. Think about the word proprietor. The proprietor is the controller of something. Proper means the way things should be, the way you should act. Property always just meant a characteristic of something. So the idea was this. We are human actors. We have our naked bodies. We're born into the world. We have the ability to directly control our bodies, to manipulate things in the world to act. When we manipulate things, we interfere with, with, with things in the world according to our understanding of the laws of causality to try to affect the outcome 
that would otherwise happen. This is the entire nature of the human experience, of human existence. Every action you perform is an attempt to change what you think would be the future outcome if you hadn't acted. It's always an attempt to interfere, and to interfere means to successfully employ, to take advantage of the nature of the causal world, to interfere using the laws of physics, for example. Now, the nature of human humanity is that we are isolated bodies, but we live in a physical world of other resources. We directly control our bodies, which are scarce resources, but there are other resources too that we always necessarily employ when we act. Um, number one, there's a physical world that's a background condition. According to Austrian economics, these are sort of the general conditions of human action, uh, so-called free goods, um, like the air or like gravity or things like this, things that people don't really own. And then there are resources which you need to directly con – which you need to control to help um, – to use as what Mises calls means of action. So your body is your direct means of action, but your body – with your body, you employ other means of action. So for example, if I want to achieve some result, some goal, um, I will – um, employ some resource to do that. So I might pick up a stick to use it as a lever, for example. I'm using the stick as a means and my body as a means. Now that stick is a scarce resource and I'm employing it as a means. It's an extension of my ability to interfere with the causal laws of the world. So it's a property of me. It's a characteristic of me. It's almost like my identity. If there's some means I use regularly or successfully, like clothing or a hut, or uh, a watch or tools or whatever, you think of those as – or your glasses, you know, lots of things that are associated with a person's identity. Um, you use them all the time as a regular way to interfere with the world, so it's a property of you. It's a way of extending your identity into the world. Now, this is a little bit metaphorical, a little bit flowery, and that's fine, but it's, it's a good explanation of why we would say that stick is a property of you. Because you're using it as part of your way of interfering with the world. So over time, we start calling the stick, that's your property. Okay, But we have to be careful. A, a better way to put it, if you're ever confused, is just stop and think, let's identify the resource that's an issue. And it's always a scarce resource. Okay, And if I forget to mention this in a minute, someone remind me. There's another area of confusion about um, what the object of a conflict is. Uh, for example, just to take a quick aside, people say that people fight over religion. Well, that's just false. If you think about it precisely, people never fight over religion. They can't fight over religion. The reason is religion is not an, a scarce resource that can be owned. So there's no conflict possible over religion. Okay? When people speak like this, what they mean is – they mean it's a compact way of referring to something else. What they're saying is – and they're mixing together two things. What they're saying is there is a conflict. Yes, there's a conflict between human actors, and the conflict is always, always of necessity and necessarily over some scarce resource, either people's bodies or the other resources that they control – land, houses, animals, um, other possessions, women and children, and societies where those are considered to be ownable resources of some head of household, etc. Okay, That's what the fight is always over, but when they say they're fighting over religion, they're switching the subject to talk about the cause or the motivation, the reason people fight. So for example, if I see someone and I just pick up a gun and shoot them in the head, and they haven't committed aggression against me, I'm committing a pure act of murder. So the description of the action is an action of murder because it's an intentional use of a means, the gun in my arms, to invade the borders of a resource owned by someone else, this other person's body. That's the description of the action. Now, if you ask the motivation for my action, it may be that I'm jealous of him, I'm angry at him for uh, insulting my mother, whatever. And you could say, we're fighting over my girlfriend, we're fighting over my mother. You could say that, but what you really mean is that's the that's the motive, that's the explanation of the reason why you committed the act of aggression. But the act of aggression itself is not really over the girlfriend; it's over some scarce resource. Always, 
always, always. Uh, this is one reason, to go back to my original topic, one reason I am getting more and more leery about using the word property to refer to the resource. I always try to refer to, identify what the resource in question is, that there's a conflict over, and then you can say it has an owner or someone has a property right in that resource. But the question is, who has the property right in that resource? The question is not, is the resource property? That makes no sense. The question can be, is the resource a scarce resource that's ownable? That can be a question. But the advocates of intellectual property and other laws don't like to put it that way because it, it, it makes their entire argument for uh, property rights in uh, intangible things like songs and recipes and uh, inventions. Uh, it makes it hollow and transparently uh, false. Uh, which is why I think we need to keep the language clear, consistent, and objective. Um, so that's another example of of, um, um, of this flaw. In some of the talks I mentioned earlier, I go into a lot more detail about a lot more cases of this. Um, before I, I pause for questions, although I'd be happy to take any questions that might arise before I'm done, let me give one more example as an illustration of what I think is the power of this kind of clear, unadorned, um, consistent way of looking at, at these libertarian issues. And by the way, um, I would suggest people take a look at Ho Hans Hermann Hoppe's introduction to Murray Rothbard's The Ethics of Liberty. He does a good um, uh, contrast between Robert Nozick and Rothbard. This is not exactly on the topic of what I'm talking about, but um, whatever you say about Rothbard, you can't say he wasn't clear. He was a very clear, honest, and direct and forthright writer. Um, very systematic, explained what he was saying. You'll notice this is not always true of other people, of other writers, especially socialists and mystics and people like that. Um, now, I don't know what the causation here – I don't know which way the causation runs here. Um, I sometimes think that they're confused writers. Um, they're socialist and they're 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 wrong because they're confused thinkers and that just manifests itself in confused writing. And sometimes I think they sort of know they're wrong and they try to hide it with confusing language. They try to avoid being explicit and clear about what they're advocating. So for example, a typical conservative or liberal is really in favor of slavery. They don't want to use that word. They don't want to admit that they're in favor of it. Um, they will even admit that they're in favor of aggression, but very begrudgingly. And they will always say something like, um, well, we believe in liberty. It's a value, but it's just one of many values. Unlike the libertarian, um, it's not our highest or top value. So you see what they do. They subtly change the subject, and they try to make a straw man. They say that libertarians only believe in liberty. Now, in a way, that's true as libertarians, but no one is just a libertarian. Every libertarian that has ever lived and will ever live values liberty but values other things too in their capacity as a human being. They value love and friendship and learning and honesty and uh, survival, lots of things. But the point is the libertarian believes that aggression is simply unjustified and unjustifiable. That's what they believe. It doesn't mean it's their top value or their only value. It means what knows it called it's a side constraint. It means it's something that we simply believe is not justifiable. If you put it that way, our opponent's position is, is really this. They think sometimes aggression is permissible. Now, their reason for it is that they think that there are other values that are more important than that. And if that's their argument, they should just come out and say it. They should say, like a socialist or a communist would, you have to break some eggs to make an omelet. right? To have law and order, which the conservatives favor, or to have equality, which the liberals or the progressives favor, you have to relegate – you have to trample on private property rights, and you have to commit what is otherwise seen as an injustice. That's what they believe. So they don't want to put it that way because it makes them look like a criminal because a criminal believes something similar. He thinks it's okay to rape – excuse me – or attack or kill someone um, because he thinks something else is more important, his personal desires, for example. Uh, the socialist… Of various forms, which in which I include conservatives in that in that uh, category, um, they believe that aggression is sometimes justified. 
is true. They're sometimes against aggression, but sometimes they're in favor of it. And you can make an argument for that, perhaps. I don't think it would be coherent. But the argument for that mixed position that aggression is sometimes justified and sometimes not cannot be that the libertarian is wrong because he only believes in liberty. That's just not the case, and that's not a reason that we oppose aggression. We oppose aggression because we believe it's unjustifiable. It's incoherent to make an argument for aggression when you're engaged in the peaceful activity of argumentation with someone who you're treating as a civilized uh, neighbor in the first place. This is basically a distillation of Hans Hermann Hoppe's argumentation ethics. Now, before I uh, pause for Q&A, let me return to the example I was going to give. Now, to my mind, this is a very interesting example. Number one, because I've never seen anyone address this issue, um, and because it, it it's a two-sided issue that has led to confusion on many libertarian issues. And this is this this idea. I'm gonna I'm gonna assert it as a as a statement that a lot of libertarians believe, sort of as a knee-jerk belief. And both of which are false, and both of which lead to uh, confused uh, co uh, 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 conclusions about other areas of libertarian um, uh, theory and application. The first is the idea that if you own something, you can sell it. In other words, the idea is that ownership of something is a relationship or a status that necessarily implies the ability to sell the thing. Okay? Now, I think that's actually false. Um, and I think the only way to see that it's false is to have a clear understanding of the basic, foundational, fundamental principles of libertarianism. And by the way, one of the first places I would recommend people turn to to start getting a ground-up, clear view of the propertarian libertarian ethic would be chapters 1 and 2. Chapters 1 and 2 of Hans Hermann Hoppe's A Theory of Socialism and Capitalism. Very short chapters but just packed with amazingly clear uh, insights, which are the foundation of my entire personal political libertarian theory. Okay, And then the converse view, which I think is also false, is if you sell something, you must own it. In other words, if there is a, a transaction in a market where someone sells, can be characterized as having sold something, that must mean that they had to own the thing in order to have sold it. Because you can't sell something unless you own it. Now, I think that's also uh, completely false uh, and terribly confused. Um, there are germs of truth in each one, and there are cases in which they're both correct, but they're not correct as general statements. But the only way to see this is to have a clear understanding, as I said earlier, of property rights as rights in scarce resources, also an understanding of how they arise and what the libertarian principles are. And that is, the libertarian view is that. Um, rights are acquired in scarce resources in two ways. Well, three ways actually, but there are two types of scarce resources that are ownable. One is the human body, and another is external resources which are scarce and which at one point had no owner. Okay. In the case of a human body, the presumptive owner is the person himself that controls directly, directly controls that body. Like I own me, I own my body. Um, that's the presumptive answer because it's not always the answer. For example, it's sometimes okay to coerce someone or to treat them like a slave if they are committing aggression against you, for example, or if they have committed aggression and you're trying to um, uh, restrain them or bring them to justice or eliminate them as a threat or incapacitate them or punish them in retaliation, uh, for example. So there are cases in which you can overturn the presumption, but you have to have a reason. So normally, each person is presumed to own their body unless there's a reason why someone else has a better right. And that only reason we libertarians recognize is basically an act of aggression. And that's inherent in the idea of aggression and the non-aggression principle, which says that you're entitled to use force only in response to force, initiated force. Okay, So that implies that you never have the right to initiate force but against someone else's body. But you do have the right to respond with force if someone else did initiate force. That's a very profound um, insight. It's clean. It's reciprocal. It's symmetrical. It's the heart of the libertarian um, ethic. Okay. Now, in the case of scarce resources, the, the, 
the, the, the, the basic presumption is the person who has an earlier use claim demonstrated public use of this resource. That is, they put up borders around it. They mixed their labor with it to show that they've owned it. They have some kind of connection or link to this thing. They have a better claim than anyone else unless that second person has a reason to overcome that. And the only two reasons to overcome the presumption would be, number one, if the second person who's a latecomer claims the resource has a contract with the earlier guy, then he has a better claim because the earlier guy gave it to him by contract. He basically abandoned the resource in favor of this second person. Or if the owner of the resource has committed some kind of invasion of the property rights of the other person and owes him rectification or restitution. He owes him something. He has to make it up to him. In that case, the second person may have a claim over the resources owned by the the bad guy, the malfeasor. Okay? So that's basically it. Self-ownership except for aggression in terms of the body and first ownership for external resources unless there's a contract or a tort. By these very simple principles, we can always answer the question, in principle at least, when, we, when there's a dispute with two or more people over the control of a given resource, whether it's someone's body or some other resource, we can always answer the question, who has the better claim to it? Who should be recognized as the owner? Who has the property right in it? We simply ask, was there a tort? Was there a contract? Is it his body? Who was the first user? By answering these, by asking these questions and getting the evidence about the situation, we can always, in principle, have an answer to the question. And that is what libertarianism is. So you see, it's always about what a resource is, a resource that's disputed by two or more people. And remember, only a scarce resource can be disputed. You can't dispute an idea. You can't dispute information. You can't dispute a religion. You can only dispute things that can be disputed over, that is, scarce means of action. Okay. Only in those cases do we identify what the thing is that's being fought over, um, and then we can formulate the libertarian answer by applying our basic principles to the case um, at hand. Okay. So to return quickly to the example and um, um, of if you if you if you uh, if you own something you can sell it. Well, that's not true. Ownership doesn't mean the right to sell something. Ownership means the exclusive, the legally, the socially recognized exclusive legal right to control a resource. So it doesn't automatically imply the right to sell something. For example, your body. So this this comes up in the case of uh, in the debate over involuntary slavery. I'm sorry, voluntary slavery, uh, which I've had with Walter Block and others, uh, for example. Um, Walter thinks that he thinks that ownership necessarily implies the right to sell because he's used to thinking of ownership in terms of these external resources. And it is true that in the case of an external resource, you can sell it. But the reason you can sell it is because of the way you acquired it. All external resources are acquired by an actor, always. This is an essential feature of the act of acquisition. An actor is a human being with a body, that he already has the body. It's impossible to think of homesteading of your body. So homesteading applies only to external resources. And what it means is having the legal right to control a resource that you were the first user of, that you acquired from its unowned state and that you asserted an ownership right over that didn't previously have an ownership right and where your ownership right is maintained only because um, of your manifested expressed intent to the world I claim this is mine it's your intent to own that makes it your property if you didn't want to own it you just temporarily possessed the stick and dropped it and left it it would be abandoned and subject to rehomesteading or reuse by someone else. So in other words, the, the nature of the way that we come to own external resources is by acquisition, and that nature means that we can end the acquisition by ceasing our intent or our use of the thing. That means it's possible to abandon 
Just like it's possible to acquire a resource by sending a signal to the community, say by putting a fence up around it, declaring to the world, this thing which was previously unowned, I now claim as mine. You're sending a signal to the world. Okay. When you stop sending the signal by taking the fence down or putting up a sign saying, I give this thing up, or telling people, I don't want this anymore, then you don't own it anymore. So because it's possible to acquire these things, which were previously unowned, which is a key fact, it's possible for them to be unacquired or abandoned. And if it's possible to abandon it, you can use that power to transfer the ownership to someone else. So for example, if I own a stick, I could abandon it, leave it on the ground for rehomesteading, or I could hand it over to you, and I could say, I'm going to give you this stick, and then I'm going to abandon it, and then you're, you're possessing it, and you can instantly rehomestead it. It's a way of transfer. So the entire idea of transfer or sale or donation or gift of a resource is a consequence or an implication or a use of the ability to abandon, which flows from the nature of the right and the resource in the first place, which was by acquisition. If you can acquire something, you can let it go. Okay. So in the case of externally acquired resources, uh, 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 resources that were externally, uh, external resources that were previously unowned, ownership of these things does imply the power to sell it. So it is true that if you own a thing, an external thing that you acquired, you can sell it. But that's only because you acquired it and you can just stop maintaining it as yours. But this doesn't apply to ownership in general because ownership also covers your property right and your body. And that was not acquired by homesteading. The idea that you acquired your body by homesteading is completely nonsensical because to acquire something by homesteading requires an actor. To, to be an actor means you have to have a body because that's how you interact with the world. But it makes no sense to say you homestead your body because if you don't have your body yet, you don't have a body to use to acquire it. The nature of ownership of bodies, as Hans Hermann Hoppe explains, and as I go into my article, how we come to own ourselves, is a different kind of basis. It's a different kind of link. It's not first use. It's our intimate connection with and our direct control over the actions of our human physical bodies. That is what gives us a better connection, a better claim to our bodies than anyone else. And that is an intimate part of our entire nature and that is why ownership of our bodies um, can't be undone by mere uh, voluntary statement, like I don't own my body anymore, or I hereby sell myself to you. Uh, I go into this in detail in my articles on inalienability, which are on my website, and in my uh, podcast with Walter Block from about a year or two ago. Um, the second statement, which I mentioned earlier, is if you sell something, you can own it. I mean, if you sell something, you must own it. In other words, if there's a sale recognized in the law, some transaction we classify legally as a sale, that implies that the thing sold was owned by the seller. Otherwise, you couldn't have sold it. Okay. So this is another case of sloppy thinking, which is used to justify intellectual property. Because, for example, people will say, well, um, you value getting knowledge. Otherwise, why would you pay a professor to teach you something? Or... In other cases, you might pay someone to teach you or to tell you an idea, and if you paid for it, that means the guy that revealed the information to you sold the information to you, and how could he sell it to you if he didn't own it? So you see there's a kind of – if you think about it, you can tell there's a subtle mistake here. There's something nagging about this kind of argument, um, and the argument is just basically um, – a lack of sophistication – it's based upon a lack of sophistication about the nature of property rights and the nature of contracts. And look, everyone doesn't have to be a legal theorist or a legal scholar. Uh, and in fact, I don't think most legal scholars get this right either because they're not Rothbardians. Rothbard anchored his entire property theory, his entire libertarian theory, his entire theory of rights in property rights. He recognized that all rights are property rights. And it's implicit in his theory. He didn't go into it into a lot of detail, but it's implicit, especially because of his adherence to Mises and his praxeology, right, which recognizes that all means of action are scarce means of action. 
Um, basically, Rothbard's theory amounts to the, the following, that um, all property rights are rights in scarce means of action, scarce resources. And this is made more explicit in Hoppe, who basically builds upon Mises and Rothbard's insights to come up with his uh, really, really modern, systematic, anarcho-libertarian um, view of political theory. Um, so if you understand that that's what property rights are, then you stop thinking of contract the way that the legal theorists and the lawyers and the legal system and the courts and the judges and sloppy thinkers who don't really know a lot about law for that matter tell us, which is that a contract is sort of a binding thing. If you promise something, it should be an enforceable obligation, blah, blah, blah. Uh, that is not a coherent theory as Rothbard explains in his um, contract, um, title transfer theory of contract. Contracts should not be seen as binding promises. You shouldn't um, think that just because you say something means that you're bound by it uh, legally. Um, uh, promises may be a moral binding, but they're not a – they shouldn't be a legal, legally obligatory binding. The only rights are property rights, so that means contract is just a, a, an implication or a consequence of property rights and scarce resources. A contract is simply – the exercise of an owner of the power to use a resource, that is to permit someone to use the resource temporarily or for a limited time or permanently, like if you abandon it or you sell the resource to them. It's the exercise of ownership of the, of the, uh, of the resource by the owner. That's all contracts are. So contracts really should just be seen as – detailed statements by the owner about what kind of permission or use of the resource is permissible by others, whether it's permanent, temporary, limited, open-ended, whatever. You know, if Avis leases you a car for a day, they're giving you the right to use the car for a limited period of time and for limited purposes. You're not allowed to destroy or resell the car, for example, or to vandalize the car. Okay, so that's a limited transfer. If a car is sold, that's a different type of transfer. If the car is given as a gift, that's another type of transfer. Um, you know, If the car is jointly owned by two or more people, that's another type of arrangement of who can control the resource. Okay. If you understand this, you'll see that there's lots of arrangements that people can do contractually. And there's different varieties, and lawyers can and should sometimes classify these things differently according to convenience and to categorize different cases and precedents. But it doesn't mean we should get confused by the language. Okay? Most contracts are bilateral, that is, an exchange of two things that are owned. If I give you a gold coin in exchange for your, um, for your um, horse, then we're exchanging title. Our contract is a bilateral mutual exchange. But if I just give you a gold coin out of charity, that's another transfer. It's a unilateral one-way transfer. Okay? There's no sale at all. There's just a one-way transfer. If I offer to pay you a gold coin if you will paint my barn, then we might call that a sale of your services or your labor by analogy to the first type of contract. But it's really not literally a sale. It's really a one-way transfer. The only thing that's being sold is the title to the gold because the labor by the painter is not owned. The fact is he has the ability to control his body because he is a self-owner or a body owner, and he can use that ability to withhold his actions to get the gold owner to agree to a conditional unilateral one-way transfer Uh, of the gold to him. So we might analogize it to an, a bilateral exchange, and we might call it a sale of labor in economics terms to sort of understand f the motivations of the parties, but the labor is not really being sold because it's not owned. It's not like the title to the labor is being transferred. So these kinds of metaphors can confuse people. So it's just simply not true that just because you can sell something means that you had to own it. Okay, So that's another example of imprecise, sloppy thinking leading to 
fallacious results and leading to a very pernicious, uh, dangerous result, which is IP, which is one of the top five or six most harmful and pernicious doctrines um, and, and practices the government, the state, sorry, foist upon us. There's lots of other cases of things that are um, misuses of words, but those are some of the core ones I like to focus on. And uh, at this point, I'd be happy to uh, open the floor up for any kind of Q&A. Thanks. Sorry, right. we've got our first question from Jack Baker. Um, will you explain, I guess, in more detail why a person cannot sell or contract the complete and exclusive use of their body and mind? Well, I think I, I just tried to um, in, a, in a brief fashion, but my answer is that it's not that they cannot sell it. Um, I, would, I would put it this way. Um, let's imagine a sale where we both agree is a sale. Uh, let's say that um, I agree to give you my gold coin in exchange for your giving me title to your uh, horse. Okay. Now, if I give you the coin and you refuse to give me the horse, we would both agree, I think, that now I'm the owner of the horse because you already set in motion the transfer of title to the horse based upon a condition, which was me giving you the title to my coin, which I've done. So now I own the horse. You're maybe in possession of it, so now you're basically stealing my horse if you refuse to let me take it. Okay. And I could use force to get the horse. And if I do use force to take the horse, I'm not being a horse thief. I'm being a property owner asserting his property rights in a resource that he owns. Okay. So the consequence of, of recognizing something as a sale is that we're seeing that title has transferred and that now force may be used to enforce it. Okay. So the question is, if I promise to be your slave, okay, the only dispute really arises when I change my mind and I try to run away. So let's say I say I'm going to be your slave, and let's say I do it for a month and I – I want to try it. I want to try being your slave. But I promise to be your slave for two months. I said I, I hereby promise I will be your slave for two months. Okay. Now, a month into it, I decide to run away. So the only question is, if you don't try to stop me, there's no conflict. There's no dispute. There's no question to, to solve. If you try to stop me, you want to use force against me to stop me. You want to shoot me or capture me or put me in manacles or whatever. Then the question is, now we have a dispute. I claim the right to use my body. You're claiming the right to use my body. So the, the only libertarian question is, who has the right to use my body? And more precisely, do you have the right to use force against me? Now, what is the basic libertarian principle? You only have the right to use force in response to force. That's it. So you're using force against me to stop me from running away. Now, that's presumptively aggression, initiated force, unless you can show that I initiated force against you first. But I didn't. All I did was utter words at you. I said, I promise to be your slave. Now, uttering words at someone is not an initiation of force. Any more, that's why we believe in free speech, because usually sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Right? Usually words are not aggressive. And a promise is not an aggression or a threat either. Okay, So to my mind, you don't first come up with contract theory and use it to justify the use of force. I think it's the other way around. I think we first look at the nature of the situation, the nature of the interaction, and we ask, is force justified in this case? And if it's not, then contract theory follows from that. Now, it seems to me clear that someone promising to be a slave is not committing an act of aggression. So therefore, the, the, the would-be slave has not committed an act of aggression. He's never done anything that justifies force being used against him. It's that simple. So the consequence of that is that the promise to sell yourself into slavery doesn't give rise to the right of someone else to use force, which means that there's no way to sell yourself because that's the only way you could do that. So that's the answer I give. Uh, I know some libertarians disagree with that. Um, but that's that's my position on that issue. 
All right, and if you'd like to ask a question, you can ask in text on the questions tab to the right, or if you'd like to ask on webcam, you can click video chatting above the chat window on the right, and then click start your webcam, and I'll be able to ring you on screen. Uh, our next question, uh, as uh, Stefan moves, is uh, I'm just from Sorry. Uh, what concept justifies sustaining a property right in a thing when it is no longer in immediate use? Yeah, that's a, that's a that's a harder question, and that's one where maybe um, say mutualists or some mutualists and um, um, libertarians would disagree. Um, my view is um, my my view is this: um, when we talk about property rights, okay, when we have a normative political disagreement, like we're I won't say having not having now, but we're talking about that kind of disagreement. We're talking about when people Whenever there's a dispute, there's always a dispute over who gets to control that resource. Okay, so what the disputants are always asking, if they're having a, some kind of civilized forum or discussion about their resource, they're trying to ask who should be the owner of the resource. Okay, they're not asking who should possess the resource. There's always a distinction between possession and ownership. The law makes that distinction too. So, for example, um, if I build a, a log cabin on virgin territory and I have a farm and a house and I leave town for the weekend to go get supplies and I come back and there's someone in my home um, and they won't leave now we have a dispute over who has the right to use it the law would say that um, the, the law has a complicated way of dealing with it. they say the, the first question is who has the right to possess which is sort of like quasi property rights and then who has the right to own and if you don't have the right to possess you have to let the current possessor stay in the house and you have to go to court to get them ousted okay but if they don't have the right to possess you can actually physically force them out of the house so they have these kind of graded ways of dealing with it um, I think the law is approximating what libertarians believe which is that we distinguish ownership from possession um, think of Crusoe on a desert island he has possession but not ownership because ownership is only possible in a social setting. He controls various means to achieve his ends. So he has possession of or dominion over or actual physical control over you know, nets and his hut and whatever to get things done, seashells, weapons, whatever. But he has no ownership. When there's a social context, now we say there's a possibility of another person interfering with my use of this thing. Now we want stability of possession. We want to be able to possess things, and once it's possessed, the, you want the connection to maintain as long as you intend to own it um, as the owner. Um, so I would say basically if you don't recognize that ownership rights can persist over some time period, even when there's not immediate physical control, then you simply don't believe in ownership. You only believe in possession. And you're, now you're talking about a, a non-normative mites makes right type world, in which case there are no normative questions. There's really no question to answer. There's no – you can't ask who should possess this thing. This, it's only the question of who is owning it, who, who has physically more strength to take it. You never have a dispute resolution process. Anytime you have a dispute resolution process, you're trying to ask a normative question. That is not who does control this thing. Who should be recognized as having the right to control the thing? And that question is always a question about property rights. And property rights are ownership rights, and they are simply distinct from possession. So I guess I would say if you don't believe that if, – if you believe that you, you lose ownership of a thing as soon as you quit using it, you simply don't believe in property rights at all. You basically believe in living in a mites makes right society or a war of all against all where there just simply are no norms. So you have to kind of choose, I think. Are you asking about how do we come up with a set of procedures and norms that we can all follow that are fair to everyone that settle these questions? When disputes arise, how do we come up with an answer other than interpersonal violence and physical bullying and force? All right, our next question is from Weberts. Uh, how does argumentation ethics justify all external scarce resources being owned by the first user uh, as opposed to what status believe? 
Um, that's a good question. I think that um, um, there, there are two answers, and probably one of them applies to status more. So um, uh, there, there are sort of two sides to this, and I just sort of indicated half of, half of one of those. Um, first of all, if you are asking a question about property right, who should own something, if you have any normative discussion at all about who should own a resource, then you're presupposing we have to come up with some reasonable way of determining who should be recognized as the owner so that disputes can be avoided. Okay, So there's always a presupposed norm there. We're, we're assuming that someone should be recognized as the owner, even in status legal systems. Um, now, you can never say that the first user can't have some initial right, because if so, nothing could ever be rightfully used in the first place. Like we would all just be naked, huddled, starving creatures sitting on the ground, not able to do anything. We wouldn't be able to do anything because the world would be a virgin, unowned world, and no one would be able to use anything. Okay, So the very idea of that we're searching for a norm, that is for a right answer as to who should be able to use a thing, implies that it, it – Someone has the right to use it, and for someone to have the right to use it, it had to first be used. And if you recognize the validity of that, you have to say that if there's an unowned resource, the first user of it is not violating anyone's rights and has to be able and free to do that. Right? And in fact, if you say that there's an unowned resource which someone should not be free to exploit and appropriate, then it's a contradiction because you're saying that you can stop them from using the resource. But if you can stop someone from using a resource, you are asserting ownership over the resource, okay? Because that's what a power of ownership is, is the right to exclude people. So the question is not whether it has an owner, but who should be the owner. Even the person denying that it can be appropriated by someone, the first user, is asserting ownership on behalf of the government or his society or himself or something. So he can't say there's no owner. So then we come to the question, well, who's the best owner of it? And again, if the first user doesn't have some kind of better connection, nothing could ever be used. Okay, so the only way to avoid that answer is you can you have to admit that resources have to be first used by someone, although they otherwise they would never be resources in the first place, right? Because there's a subjective element to a resource. Austrians recognize this to a good. the 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 character of a good, let's say, as a as a public good or as a private good or whatever is determined based upon the subjective preference of the user of the resource to, uh, as determined as demonstrated by their actions. Uh, and not only that, the character of it as a good at all is determined by whether someone regards it as a good as demonstrated by their actions. Okay, so you wouldn't have resources. They they basically wouldn't exist uh, if people didn't have the ability and the recognized right to first use them. So the only way to deny the first user the right to own it is to say they have the right to use it, but then someone else can take it from them by force. Okay. So basically, it's to deny what we call, what Hans Hopper calls the um, the uh, the prior later distinction. Okay. He says that basically, if you say that uh, a second comer, a late comer, someone who didn't find the resource, who didn't acquire it by contract from an earlier owner. If he has a better claim to it, well, then you've opened the door to, again, a war of all against all and a, a non, an, an, an illegal situation. right? In other words, if the first user doesn't have a property right in the resource, if it can just be taken from him by a second user, then we just don't have a property right system at all because the second user doesn't have a better claim to it than the first user. He's taking it because of he's more powerful. Or because of verbal decree. He's just asserting that he has a better claim to it. But if you recognize that as a as a touchstone for identifying who owns things, then we don't have a property rights system because anyone can verbally declare ownership of something. A million people could declare ownership of a given thing at the same time. And there'd be no way to decide among them, in which case there's no conflict avoidance mechanism being satisfied. This is not a property right. And again, if we allow the stronger to just take it, then we're not asking about the right way to resolve the dispute. We're just simply recognizing reality. The stronger beats the weaker. We don't care about right and wrong. We don't care about norms. We don't care about whether actions are just justified or not. And all that is contrary to the entire endeavor of 
making a normative, peaceful, cooperative um, inquiry among civilized people, our neighbors, our fellow men, we sit down and we say, listen, who has the better claim to this resource? I, I care, you care, we're trying to find a fair, objective answer. It just simply turns out that the only answer that can satisfy everyone and that's consistent is the libertarian one, which is why we're libertarians. All right, uh, Alan has a question. Uh, would you think that ethics and morality also fall under equivocated terms? I, I actually I don't see that problem that much. I do see that the terms are used in different ways, but I don't see that's too much of a problem. Um, sometimes ethics is used as a specialized uh, subdiscipline, a, a, a specialized normative um, aspect of a given discipline, like le legal ethics or medical ethics, um, sort of like an artificial thing that only applies to some people that's not universal. Whereas morality tends to mean some kind of objective, universal norms that um, are morally or um, uh, somehow binding on people um, as just because they're people. Um, the equivocation I do see, actually I wouldn't call it equivocation, the confusion I see um, is in the idea um, that libertarians will often point out that just because something is immoral doesn't mean it should be illegal, and they're properly, they're com completely correct about that, and that is a mistake that most conservatives and liberals um, don't get right. They they think that racism is wrong, which I think it is, and therefore we should outlaw it, right? Um, uh, conservatives think pornography is wrong, smoking marijuana is wrong, therefore we can outlaw it. So they really don't have a distinction between morals and legal rules. They think that anything that's immoral is fair game to be outlawed. So they, they sort of see law as just a stronger version of morality. Libertarians point out that not everything that's immoral should be a rights violation, but they often will go one step further and say, or they will imply when they say that, that everything that's a rights violation is immoral. So they view rights violations as a, as a proper subset of of morality. So in other words, every possible action you can think of that is a rights violation, like murder, is necessarily immoral, but not everything that's immoral is necessarily a rights violation, like being rude to your grandmother is immoral, but it's not a rights violation. Um, I don't know that much hinges upon this distinction, but I, my personal view is that is probably wrong. Um, I think that just because something is a rights violation it's not necessarily the case that it's immoral. I think it tends to be, and it probably is. So I would view morality and um, rights violations as overlapping sets, intersecting sets, not as non-aggression or aggression being a subset of rights violation or of immorality. Sorry. Um, and the reason is, and Rothbard sort of hints at this in some of his statements, where he said, "Look." All we're saying is that um, rights, um, um, certain certain laws, social practices cannot be justified. That doesn't necessarily mean – like if you, if you can prove that it's a rights violation to commit murder or to steal, it doesn't necessarily mean that from your point of view it's immoral to commit, to commit that action in some cases. Um, and you don't have to be a relativist to believe this, by the way. I believe in some objective aspect of morals. As a human, not as a libertarian, I don't believe in the thick kind of way of looking at this stuff. Uh, I'm careful about that. Um, so I'm perfectly happy to say some things are definitely objectively, clearly, obviously immoral. Um, but even given that concession, it's not clear that every act of aggression is immoral. Um, but it still means that you can't justify a law that is based upon classifying something that's not an act of aggression as, as basically illegal. We uh, were talking about this exact thing the other day, uh, Saturday, with Walter Block. He was in here, uh, and he gave the example of you know, scratching someone in order to save the world. You know, Obviously, it's still a rights violation to scratch them, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't do it. You should do it, and you'd be a hero for doing it. Yeah, I didn't hear that particular example, but... Um... Yeah, I think that's correct, and this this gets at another bad argument that's used against us. I think Walters had it used against him, 
I think by Jan Hellfeld. I have too in my anarchist debate with him. And he asked a question like, uh, if you had to break into a cabin to save your starving baby in the woods, uh, would you do it? Now, the question is strictly irrelevant, as Walter pointed out, because it what I would do or what you would do – first of all, what you would do is irrelevant. It doesn't show that it's moral if you would do it. A lot of people would do immoral things if they were pushed to it. It's, it's just – it's totally a non sequitur. It has nothing to do with – with the legitimacy of our arguments about what actions should be considered legal or not. But even if you argue that, yes, I would do it, and I would do it because I think it's moral, it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily show anything about the coherence of the idea that it is an act of aggression. And the only way to really hold that view, I think, is to view, um, to view these as intersecting sets, as I just said, instead of viewing one as a subset of the other. All right, our uh, next question is from Norman Horn. He said, usually we also include the threat of force as an act of aggression. Just to be clear, do you think that there are zero utterances of words that can be considered aggression? No, that's why earlier I said generally we, we, we believe in free speech and uh, generally words are not acts of aggression. Um, uh, and this is – it will probably take us too far afield. I did deal with this in my article with Pat Tinsley. Um, it's on my site. It was in the QJAE a few years ago. It's on causation and aggression. Um, I I believe that we have to – following Mises in his, uh, his praxeological view of human action, which is that humans have physical bodies where they interfere with the world. They act. They employ scarce means to do this. We have to understand action as always an attempt to cause some outcome um, by the use of – uh, efficacious means. When I say efficacious, it means it actually works. That is, that is, you have a, correct, a more or less correct understanding of the way causal laws work, and you're employing means that are calculated to help you achieve the results you want. You're interfering in the right way. You know, if you want to blow up a bridge, you use dynamite. You don't use, um, you know, wet cardboard. <laughs> um, so. The question is, can words ever be aggression? I don't think words themselves are aggression, but a speech act can be part of or an act of aggression itself in the right context. I mean, you can think of lots of examples. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, the leader of a lynch mob saying, "Go catch that that black guy and hang him." He may never touch the black guy, and he may not have any direct authority over the mob who has been whipped up into a frenzy. Um, he may not be coercing them, and he may not have a contract with them, um, but he may be ca playing a causal role in causing it to happen. Or you can imagine the leader of a firing squad saying, ready, aim, fire. Or another example, uh, imagine you falsely accuse someone of rape, and you go on the witness stand in the state's criminal justice system, and you lie. And you persuade the jury that this guy raped you, and he didn't, and he gets convicted to 15 years in prison. Now, you can argue whether the jury is complicit, whether the jailer and the guards are complicit, and whether the judge is complicit, whether the prosecutor is complicit. You can argue about these things. Maybe they all are. But the person who got on the stand and lied… I think is the primary causal factor of aggression being used against this guy. So they are an aggressor, uh, and all they did was utter words. They told a lie, but they knew it would have an effect in that system. So I think of depending upon the context, um, words can serve as causes of the invasions of others' body or property. Yes. Um, and I, I just uh, linked to the paper with Tinsley in the chat if uh, you'd like more information on that. Now our last question here is from Jack Vega. He asks, if you own a horse and it won't work, does it, that give you the right to use force? Why not if it's slavery? Well, the thing is there's, there's, no, there's not much dispute among libertarians about the status of the horse as an ownable resource. So that's not really a con – that's not controversial. Uh, we, we all agree that the horse is an unowned, scarce resource that someone comes to own by a certain act of uh, appropriation and dominion. Um, 
Uh, so then the question is, uh, or who's the owner, and then what's the owner entitled to do? The owner is entitled to use his resource as he sees fit, as long as he doesn't violate anyone's rights. He can use force against the horse because the horse doesn't have rights. Okay, so that's not in dispute. But to show that a human being can be have force used against him, when we all agree, as a presumptive matter, that every person presumptively owns their body. And that if force is used against them, it is aggression unless they have used aggression first, right? So that's why. The, the, the reason is you, the person is presumptively a self-owner, unlike the horse, and we cannot find an act of aggression that the would-be slave has committed that would justify force being used against him in retaliation. He simply hasn't committed an act of aggression. The horse hasn't either, but the horse doesn't need to commit aggression to have force justified to be used against him because the horse is not a self-owner. It's, it's an owned resource instead. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Stefan. This has been a pleasure as always, and thank you everyone for coming tonight. We've got a great lineup for the rest of the week here at Liberty Me U. Tomorrow night, J Justice Rambier uh, is going to be talking about open transactions, the future of accounting. Uh, it's a one of the Bitcoin 2.0 protocols that's uh, making waves and very interesting stuff. Uh, Wednesday night we've got Terry Moore, the author of The Secular Homeschooler. She's in for a uh, an author's forum. Uh, Thursday night we've got Jeffrey Tucker. He's going to give an introduction to Liberty Me and everything Liberty Me has to offer for those of you who are new around here. And then uh, Friday and Saturday we have uh, two more Bit Bitcoin related uh, seminars. So Definitely check those out if you're interested. Hope to see you back. Thanks everyone for coming tonight and have a great night.